So if you're going to start off right now, and whatever someone has said to you that's negative, don't dwell on it. Think of the positive things that people have shown in your life. Yeah. So I want you to repeat after me. Today, Today I, choose I choose to focus on the good in my life. To focus on the good in my life. I choose to water the right seeds. I choose to water the right seeds that are planted in my mind. That are planted in my mind. I am blessed. I am blessed. Amen. Amen. Whoa. Amen. Girlfriend's got a good devotion this morning, huh? Awesome. Man, I was like, whoa. Good. But it is good to be here on this beautiful Sunday morning. We appreciate y'all being here. And uh, especially those of you that are joining us for the very first time, we are glad you're here. Yeah. And um, right after the service, we would uh, ask you to meet us in the hospitality room just across the lobby there, just so we can shake your hand for a couple minutes, get to know you a little bit better, and give you a gift to take home as a token of our appreciation for you being here with us. We have special guests with us. Crystal and Marlon Robertson, they are here. All the way from the mountains of Tennessee, and uh, their daughter Cadence, nine months old, she's sitting right up here on the front row. It's so good to have them with us, and uh, lead us in worship, and join us in worship, and we're just glad that they're here today. So, as always, turn around, greet somebody if you don't know them. Tell them your name. Make a new friend as we join in worship today. God bless you for being here. All right. Man, I want to just uh, share with you for a few minutes, and, uh, and I'm going to be finished quickly because we're going to go over to the other building, and I encourage everybody to do that. But I want us to, uh, you know, we're back. You know, we've been back from the summer for a few weeks, and now uh, I want us, uh, I've kind of started making it a practice to go through one book of the Bible during the year and uh, so I've chosen the book of James and I want us to look at it and my the title for my thoughts today is uh, a practical faith and today we're gonna look at chapter one that deals with trials and temptations. everybody say trials and temptations and um, the the book of James is a very practical book and it's and it's an explanation about what faith in Jesus Christ looks like in the life of the Christian. Uh, it deals with what God does on his part and what we do on our part uh, to live out our faith. And some refer to the book of James as the Proverbs of the New Testament. Uh, it's just five chapters long, but it's very condensed and and just straightforward in uh, the way it's written. And, and I've read this book my whole life. I've read the book of James, I don't know, maybe a hundred times. And, and I always had this idea about the book of James that it was, you know, sort of a condemning, judgmental type book. And it pointed out everything I was doing wrong. Do you ever... You ever get that feeling about the book of James? Maybe it was just me. And, um, you know, I, it, it, it just accents the negative areas in our Christian life. And, uh, but as I read through it again, uh, as we're reading through the New Testament this year, in week 13 and 14, we read through the book of James, um, I saw it in a different way. I, I saw the book of James in a different light. And so... James is the half-brother of Jesus. I don't think it's bad to say that. I mean, you know, James and Jesus didn't have the same father. God was Jesus' father, right? And, uh, and so then Joseph was James' father, so he was ha the half-brother to younger brother, the Jesus. And um, he would finally come to believe. I mean, think about this. If your older brother said he was God, I don't, think, I don't think my older brother could convince me he was God. Even though when I was little, my older brother was, uh, 
I grew up in the 60s, and my older brother was like Fonzie. <laughs> Had his hair slicked back, you know, the leather jacket, T-shirt, cigarettes rolled up, you know, in the sleeve. Some of you know what I'm talking about, because you were that way. And uh, everybody he hung around with was like Fonzie. And uh, he thought he was cool, hey, hey, you know. But I never looked at my older brother like he was God. I thought he was tough and big and, and you know, all that. But James' older brother was Jesus. And he finally would come to believe that. And he would give his life uh, to Jesus Christ, his older brother, as Lord and, uh, and here's James, he, he introduces this book, and, and he says hello, basically in the first verse, and then he just dives right in to this idea of dealing with trials and temptations in our life. And, um, and what, what's interesting about this book, if you look at it, at the very end of the book, I used to think this book was very kind of, judgmental and dogmatic and I could never live up to this idea that James was putting out, you know. But if you read the very last two verses of chapter 5, it, it tells the church, it encourages the church, the people, to restore those who have turned away from the faith or have missed the mark of the faith and, and save their soul from death. And the Bible says it covers a multitude of sins. So, so James, I, I kind of had a wrong perception of, you know, this book. And I think we can do that as Christians, right? We form a certain way of thinking. We, we uh, you know, form a certain mindset about something, about worship, about preaching or whatever. And, and sometimes God has to kind of speak to our hearts to let us see that there is a different way of understanding it and look at it. And that, so that's what's happened to me here, just to kind of give you my personal story. So here it is, James 1, verses 1 through 11. Let's read it together real nice and loud so, uh, so people who are listening to us on the Internet or who will hear this later uh, over the Internet. Ready? Here we go. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad greetings my brethren count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete lacking nothing and if any of you lacks wisdom let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to you. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation, but the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field he will pass away. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flower fails, and its beautiful appearance perishes. So the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. And so James is talking uh, here about, he starts out dealing with trials and temptations in the Christian life. And, and James is writing this in, in a culture that is very uh, multi-God oriented. It's, you know, he's writing to a Roman culture that believed in many gods, uh, you know, any form of spirituality is good. That was their idea. And, and all roads lead to, to some kind of God with a little g. That was their philosophy. And so James 
is speaking directly to the believers in Jesus Christ in this culture. And, and he says, count it all joy when you wrestle with trials and temptations. And so I, I got uh, four points that I want to give you just quickly that, that kind of, so here's my idea. The, this, this is going to be, the Bible is going to be kind of our, our, our points. So as we go through this, uh, it, we're just going to read what the Bible says. That's going to be our point, okay? So today, I, I think first of all, James is saying, count it all joy because the testing of your faith works patience. I think James is saying to, the, to us today and to the believers that you have to first recognize what's going on. Test and trials are different than temptation. Uh, trials are things that God allows into our life to help us grow and become mature in our faith. Tests are given to see if we have learned the lessons that need to be learned to go to the next place or the next level. It's like school. Tests are given to us, not for the purpose of causing us to fail, but for the purpose of helping us understand what we need to learn to go to the next level. You preachers, you, you teachers ought to say amen right there. Uh, and so, tests are given to see if we've learned the lessons to go to the next place that God wants us to go. Proverbs 17, verse 3, it says, The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold. But it says, The Lord tests the hearts. In other words, God is testing the hearts of those who say they believe in Jesus Christ. And God allows tests to help us develop our character. And let me say this today. God is more interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in, in you being holy than you being happy. Let me say that again. I didn't get hard. I got a weak amen. Lord, help me here. I, I, you know, people are bailing out on me here this morning. See, God wants you to be holy more than He wants you to be happy. That's a little better. See, when we go through trials and tests, we need to learn to recognize what is going on in our lives. It's a process that God takes us through to help us grow and mature. So I've heard people say, and maybe you said this yourself, I know I have on a few occasions, you know what, life was much easier before I got saved. And now I've had people say, you know what, uh, since I got saved, I can't do nothing anymore, right? Uh, or, or, you know, everything is wrong that I do. And, and the reality is, maybe everything you were doing was wrong. That could be. But, but the point is, you know, when we give our hearts to the Lord and, and we, be, we begin to follow Jesus, it's not all about what we want. It becomes all about what He wants. And so, point two is we need to readjust to God's process. James 1.4 says that word perfect, that word actually means mature. See, and I want to help you. I, I am... I'm giving you this book because I want to help you become stronger and mature in your faith. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 and 7 says, In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus. You know, we, we were singing just a couple of minutes ago, Lord, no matter what we're going through, we give it to you. Every trial, every problem, every need, every circumstance, every situation in our families, Lord, we give that to you. That's a, that's a, 
a test of your faith to see if you can just let God take care of it rather than you try to shoulder the load of that on your own. Amen? And so your life as a Christian is now to be lived to the glory of Jesus. And so it takes a readjustment of our lives. We no longer live for ourselves. We live to glorify God. It's not about you anymore. Look at your neighbor say, it's not about you anymore. I know that might be a revelation to somebody here, but, you know, we say it like this, you know, when people are all about themselves and always want it their way, we say, here's you and here's the world, <laughs> you know? And, and it's not about you anymore. God's way of doing things is to teach us patience through trials and tests. Patience causes us, as James said, when we come to an end of ourselves, to ask God for the wisdom to know what to do in this situation. And so, we have to readjust. Thirdly, you got to reach out for God's help. James 1 and 5 said, If anybody lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all, liberally to all who ask, and, and it will, without reproach, and it will be given to him. See, James talks about trials and tests, but he also talks about temptation. And let me just talk to you about temptation for a minute. Temptation is different than trials and tests because temptation comes from the enemy, comes from the devil. It doesn't come from God. James even says that. And so when you are tempted, you have to recognize that that temptation does not come from God it comes from the enemy. And James gives us a cycle of temptation in verses 12 through 16. Let's just read those real quickly. It said, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he's been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desires have conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So as we look at this cycle of temptation, uh, here's the way it works, and I'm going to give this to you quickly. You, we recognize that temptation comes from the enemy, not from God. James says, don't. When you're tempted to sin, don't blame it on God because it's not who God who, who tempts you. It's the enemy. And we see that, first of all, a temptation is presented to us. Maybe, you know, uh, something c comes in uh, into our life and, and it's a, it, there's, there's a, a place where we can sin. You know, maybe you're in a store and you see something you want, and you don't have any money. And you say, nobody's looking. You know, nowadays there's cameras. Everybody sees you. You, no, you can't hardly go anywhere without being seen anymore. But, but these, this temptation is presented to us. Secondly, we're enticed when we start to think about it. Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23 it says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If you, uh, therefore, the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, once you understand that it's a temptation, don't give in to it. Even though you are tempted to give in to it, you're enticed about it. Let God's word be what you base your decisions on. Base your decisions on what God says, not what you think or what somebody else thinks. And so we are enticed. And then we, we start to think about it. We mull over it. We, we you know, start to, you know, when we, when we were young, they used to tell us in youth group, you know, if you look at a good-looking girl, the first time, it's not a sin. It's that second look that's the sin. That's what they used to tell us. 
And so, you know, sometimes I'd be walking down the street and I'd see her and I'd, I'd just, you know, I, I just wouldn't allow myself to look. They always taught us the second look was the sin. I don't know if that's true or not, but what if you take that first long look, maybe? I don't know. But, but you know, and then, and then we think about it and we start to move toward it. We start to organize a plan to do it. I think it was Rod Parsley who said, we never fall into sin. We run at it as hard as we can go, you know? And I think that's true. Sin is not something we do accidentally. It's something we make a choice to do. We move toward it. 1 Corinthians 6, 18, notice what it says. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 2 Timothy 2.22 says it like this. Flee youthful lust but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. In other words, once you start moving toward it, then you're, you're, you're probably going to commit that sin. You rationalize it. You say to yourself, you know what, it's not bad. Or, or you say this, you know what, a lot of people do a lot worse things than me. We, we, you know, uh, uh, you know, people do terrible things. This is not that bad. And, 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 or here's one. You ready for this one? But it feels so right. <laughs> you, you know, it, it just feels so right. I've had married people come and say to me, Pastor, I'm just not happy. And, being with the other person, it just makes me feel so right. And I'm thinking to myself, but it's so wrong. <laughs> and, and how long is it going to feel right when you hook up with this one? That feeling is going to go at some point. You're going to have to learn to live with them just like you have to learn to live with this person, right? And, you know, and so we... We say, oh, but it just feels so right. I, I've, had peri I've had people say to me, Pastor, I know it's wrong, but it feels so right. And, and you, you can't live by your feelings. So we move towards sin, and then we act on it. We do it. We act it out. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For a righteous man will fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked will fall by calamity. See, we, Hebrews 4, let's look at that one, 14 to 16. Seeing then that we have a high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. In other words, James is saying Jesus was tempted too in every way like we are. Temptation is common. We all deal with it. But we have a way of escape. Jesus has given us a way out. And, and so we act on our temptations. And then I put this lastly, we die from it. Because that's the end of it. The, the natural end of, of falling to the temptation to sin is you die from it. Whether you die spiritually or, or it causes you to die physically, which happens too, we die from it. And so how do we overcome it? I think, first of all, we, to overcome the temptation when we're tempted, I think the first thing you should do is, is magnify the consequences of that sin you're thinking about. Think all the way through the process uh, of, of what's going to happen if you do this. What's going to be the end result? Ask yourself, what will happen if I get caught or found out doing this? Who will I hurt? Who will I disappoint if I do this? 
It's interesting. Let me, let me just share this with you. You know, we hear about this whole Ashley Madison thing. You know, this website where you can have affairs and you're, it's, it's supposed to like, you know, keep you anonymous. But somebody hacked into this account and put all these anonymous names out. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that was God. I don't know. What's not good, Jim, is from what we understand, there's 4,000 pastors whose name is on that list. Mine ain't one of them. <laughs> but, and, and, and what was said was, there have been resignations now all across America in churches since these names have come out. I don't want to make it worse than it is, you know. But, but the point is, you don't think through what you're doing or what's going to happen if somebody hacks into that account. Who would have thought of that? But Ashley Madison, they, you know, they, they promoted this idea, life is short, have an affair. We'll keep it a secret, and then you pay to be on this website. Who will it hurt? Who will it disappoint? But the reality is that James says, God always gives us a way out of our temptation. Think through it. And I think if you guard your time, guard your relationships. You know, be careful about being on the Internet. Be accountable to somebody. Don't keep everything a secret. Secrets are not always good. And so, I think the last thing is we need to use the Word of God to overcome temptation like Jesus did in the wilderness. In other words, when he was tempted by the devil to sin, he, he said, it is written. This is what the Bible says. Maybe that's one of the reasons we've talked that people don't like to read the Bible nowadays because they don't want to know what it says about sin. And so, talk to a friend about your struggles and, and, and be accountable to them about your weaknesses and your trouble. You know, get somebody that's spiritually stronger than you are. Don't get somebody that's going to agree with you yeah, I know, I've had the same thing. Don't worry about it. That's not the kind of friend you want when you're being tempted. You know? It's like a woman who's thinking about a, a divorce. Don't talk to another divorced woman. She's only going to help you, you know? And, uh, and so, accountability is a good thing. And then lastly, let me give you this. And I think this is the most important thing. Rekindle your love for Jesus. See, you, you can't live your life focusing on trying to overcome trials and temptations and expect always to be victorious. Don't spend your life fighting temptation. Spend your life loving Jesus. You've got to focus on your love for Jesus in your Christian life. You know, you can be a Christian and not love Jesus. You believe that? I know a lot of Christians who are not in love with Jesus. They're going through the motions, they're obeying the rules, you know, they're involved in the ministry, but their heart is not in love with Jesus. Uh, James 1.18, in the Living Translation, I know it's not up there, but it says, God gave us Jesus who loves us. And so here's my point, and, and maybe if somebody can come and play, we're going to close here. Here's my idea. Jesus loves you. Love Him back. Love Him back. He loves you. Give your heart to Him. Right now. Turn back to Him. Rekindle your love for Jesus. 
And when you do, your temptations will not be so strong. Your temptations will be weaker and weaker because you won't be focused on them, you'll be focused on Jesus, right? I mean, you know, I'm not tempted to gamble because I'm working too hard to make a living, right? So I don't think about gambling because I just lose my money when I gamble. And so I'm focused on taking care of my business, you know, my family. So here's my idea. Let's stand. We'll close today. We're going to pray. As we close today, James tells us that we face tests and trials. That's God's process of maturing us. And we face temptations from the enemy from without to pull us away from God and cause us to sin. But Jesus came to provide a way out for us. He came to break the, the power of sin in your life and mine. Amen? Thank God He did. Because we were all born in sin, slaves to sin. And today I think we should just close by saying, Thank you, Jesus, for giving me a way out of my sin. Help me, Lord, as we sang to surrender all to Him. Give our lives to Him. Stay close to Him no matter what happens in your life. Don't allow the distractions that you face to, to distract you from the most important thing in your life, and that is your relationship with the Lord. And when you do, James tells us that we'll be victorious and that we'll live out our faith and we'll be examples of what it means to be a Christian and we'll live by the blessings of the Christian life. I believe that. Amen? So here's what I want to do. I want us to pray. I don't know where you are this morning with God. Maybe you just need to say, okay, Lord, thank you for loving me, giving me a way out. You died on the cross and shed your blood that my sins, my sin could be forgiven and that I could have a new life in you. Thank you, Lord, for that. And then ask God to help you. Maybe you're dealing with a habit. Maybe you know it's a sin, but it's kind of got a hold of you. What you got to do is you got to recognize it for what it is You've got to renounce that thing in Jesus' name. You've got to repent of it. And then you've got to just keep moving forward and say, God, I'm going to do my best not to do it again. With your help and by your grace, I'll, I'll have victory over this. Amen? And so as we pray today, we're going to ask God to be with us. And if you need to pray about something particular in your life, we're not, you know, you know, when you talk about the book of James, you, my take has always been it's kind of like the fickle finger of God is pointing at me, you know. But James is saying, listen, the Christian life is lived through a relationship with Jesus, and that life is a victorious life. It's a powerful life. And so this morning I want us to pray together, and I want you to ask the Lord, to touch your situation. Maybe it's somebody in your family. Maybe it's, you know, something in your own life. But we want to pray, and we want to ask God to help us. We want to remember to pray for Steve's sister. She's, in the, she's uh, having problems with her kidneys again. And so we want to lift her up in prayer and ask the Lord to be with her. We want to pray for Henry, that the Lord would be with him. We thank God Beulah got home. She's doing good. Yeah doing good maybe she can be here next week I hope she can but I told her we missed her when she's not here and so we're going to pray for them and if you have a need you'd like us to pray with you about you just raise your hand we're going to pray we're going to believe that God 
is going to meet your need, whatever it is. God is able, amen? Look at your neighbor and say, God is able to meet your need. God is able. And so if you'd like us to pray with you and for you, you can come and stand at the front. Just come right on up. We're going to believe that God is going to meet every need. Maybe you need wisdom. Maybe you need to say, Lord, how do I deal with this? What should I do about this? You know, should I say something or not say something? Should I do something or not do something? That's really what the book of James is all about. It's really about what God's part is and what our part is in this life of faith. And James really helps us to understand that. And that we're going to talk about that more as we go along.